Nothing is stable. Nothing can be relied upon. Nothing is assured. Nothing that is except this truth, this one reality, this one person. The God who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of His will. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. And Jonathan, we're continuing to look at the riches of Christ today and really taking a look at where we build our foundation. I mean, based on what you just said, the things that so many of us try and build the foundation of our lives upon, our relationships, the prestige or position that we may hold, the size of our bank accounts, uh, our health, all these different things. Sounds like you're saying every single one of those is going to disappoint. And there's only one secure place, one secure uh, person that we can build our foundation upon. Well, it is wonderful. Paul wants to highlight for us again and again in this rich letter of Ephesians that God has given to his people in Christ an incredible inheritance. And here in this section of the passage that we're going to look at today, he wants to emphasize for the fact that this was actually something that God planned out long ago. Hmm. Now, that can be an idea that we can struggle with a little bit. It's a lot to get our heads around. But it is a wonderful reassurance for the believer that our position before Christ is not something is not something random, and not something that we've just taken hold of on our own, but it's something that God planned out. And knowing that God had a plan for us in Christ gives us amazing security. Hmm. Because if it's something that God intended and God planned, it's not something that's going to fall apart. And in a world full of such uncertainty and change and sometimes chaos, how wonderful to think that God has a plan for his people. It is a wonderful plan, and we're going to look a little bit more at this topic today from Ephesians chapter 1. We're really drilling down in verses 11 to 14, so if you can, grab a Bible and join us there as we begin the message, Chosen, Included, and Sealed. Here's Jonathan. Well, I guess we all know that we live today in a very me-centered culture, a very me-centered society. Each one of us is instinctively me-centered in our natural selves. I think we know that. You don't need to teach a baby to be concerned for its own needs. You don't need to convince a small child to be selfish. And throughout life, we do want our needs to be met. We want our dreams to be fulfilled. We want our accomplishments to be recognized. That's our personal, and that is our cultural reality. But if we're familiar with the Scriptures, if we know the Christian faith, we'll also know that the Bible presents to us a radically countercultural worldview in this respect. Because the Bible lays before us a worldview that is profoundly God-centered and not me-centered. Now, on one level, if we're Christian people here this morning, we know that. We, we, we get it. We understand these things. God is God. We are his creatures. We belong to him and we depend upon him for everything. But as much as we know these things and understand these things and acknowledge them to be true, you and I do still tend toward a me-centered view of the world, even when it comes to the matter of our own salvation. After all, when it comes to the matter of our personal salvation, in this realm, above all other realms, we do see the sovereign God at work doing something wonderful for us and in us. And as we think about these things, we see ourselves as intimately involved in the process of receiving and taking hold of what God has done for us. And so as we think upon these things and reflect on our place within them, we easily place ourselves at the center of the storyline, at the center of the picture once more. Here in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is giving us the big picture of who we are and of what we have in Christ. He's showing us what God has done for us in his grace and in his mercy. And he's helping us to see the wider implications of God's gracious work in each of our lives. And in the verses where we focus our attention in particular this morning, Paul is at pains to show us that God's work in us and for us, his generosity to us in Christ, it is very much something that he achieves in his own strength and for his own purposes. We're unbelievably privileged to be on the receiving end of the grace of God. But Paul wants us to see that even the salvation we receive is a profoundly God-centered thing. 
It is a profoundly God-centered thing, first of all, because it is something that is planned by God. Verse 11, follow with me. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. With some very momentous weather events taking place in recent days, news outlets have published some spectacular photographs taken from space showing the size and the extent of that storm system that has so affected the east coast of the United States. And I've been fascinated to look at some of those photographs and the sheer power of nature and the sheer scale of nature, the sheer size of that hurricane as it was. And I have to say, looking at those photographs of the Earth taken from the International Space Station, the ones I saw were, looking at those photographs, they do help us to put our life here on Earth into some kind of perspective. It reminds us just how very small we are. From our perspective here down at ground level, it's easy to imagine that we ourselves are at the very heart of the action. That what's going on in my life this week and in my situation is really the most important thing in all the universe, is really the biggest deal around. (laughs) But when you see a photograph taken from 200 miles above the surface of the earth, you remember, don't you, that you are minuscule. That in a universal sense, I am microscopic. And but for the kindness and the interest of God, you and I would be totally insignificant creatures. Now remember that here in Ephesians chapter 1, God has just given us the universal view, the heavenly perspective on his plans and his purposes in the world. Last week we saw that God's universal plan, verse 10, is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. Now, that's the satellite image, if you like. That is the big picture. That's what God is doing in the world, in time and in space and in history. And you and I, of course, we do have a part to play in all this. Wonderfully, God has included. We have a role in this great drama. But we do not have the starring role, I'm afraid. We're not the hero. We're not the protagonist. We're not even the co-star, any one of us. Here is how we fit in. God has chosen us if we belong to Christ. If we're in Christ, he has predestined us, as we spoke about last week. He has set us apart for salvation, and he has done so that we might come under the headship of Christ as members of his saved people, even his church. Now, we would like to think that the idea was ours, that the wisdom was ours, that the initiative was ours, but no, says Paul, God chose us. And God's planning, God's choosing, well, it is so characteristic of what the sovereign God does. He works out everything, verse 11, in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is sovereign, God is in control, and he is working out everything that takes place in his world in accordance with his plans and his purposes, in accordance with his gracious will. As I was working through this text in recent days, I was reflecting on all the very unsettling things going on in our world all around us even this week. We had the anniversary of 9-11, didn't we? And the vivid memories for so many of us of that very terrifying day. I was listening to some radio commentary on the anniversary of 9-11 in the car, and the hosts were just recalling that feeling that the world was coming to an end. Do you remember it? when not just the first, but the second plane struck the towers and it became clear that this was intentional and we thought, what's coming next? Are we safe? Then yesterday, we had the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the start of what has been called the Great Recession. Again, a decade ago, it felt as though we sat on the edge of a great precipice and we didn't know what might lie at the bottom. And then, of course, that dreadful storm in the Carolinas and the fears and the realities of so much destruction that awful typhoon in Southeast Asia, still ongoing, even as we gather here. And it's just been a series of reminders this week of the fragility of this world and the instability of life in this world. Nothing is stable. Nothing can be relied upon. Nothing is assured. Nothing that is except this truth, this one reality, this one person. The God who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. 
And if we belong to Christ, if we're trusting him today, how wonderful it is to know that his plans for us, his purposes for us, his intentions to save us, they are immovable. They are unshakable. They are irreversible. I think that is a hallelujah moment. I think that's quite right. If it was our plan if it was our initiative, if it was our work in any way, how unstable it would be, how uncertain. But praise God, our salvation rests on his initiative, his plan, his purpose. This God-centered salvation, it is planned by God. Next, it is intended for God's glory. Verse 12, God did all this in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. I wonder if you've ever spent any time reflecting on the question of why it is that God has done what he has done in our salvation. Why did he send his beloved son to live and die as a human being? Why did he cause the good news to be spread by the apostles and then through the church? Why did he, as Paul has just said here, predestine men and women to belong to him? Why did he set his love upon me and upon you? Why did God do these things? Now, that is a very big question, a significant question. And pondering that question, we might come up with a range of different answers, all of which would hold some truth, probably. We might say that God did these things to demonstrate his great love. He he did these things because he has a heart of compassion for the humanity that he has made. He did these things because he wanted to spare us the agonies of judgment. He did these things because he wanted to give us hope and a future, joy and acceptance. And all of those answers hold some truth, of course. But the simplest, the biggest, and the clearest answer is the answer Paul gives us here in verse 12. God did these things, says Paul, for the praise of his glory. Jatha Griffiths with part of a message called Chosen, Included, and Sealed. And we'll get back to this look at Ephesians 1 in just a moment, so hope you'll stay with us. Well, even after we come to Christ and we've been walking with Him for some time, you can get to the point where it's easy to appear godly in public, but behind closed doors, we still continue to wrestle with and deal with sin. J.C. Ryle has written about that in a book entitled Holiness, and in this book, He reminds us that holiness, it shouldn't be cold, it's not distant nor unobtainable, but that Christ himself is the root of our godliness. And we can strive to be holy in every area of our lives. Holiness, J.C. Ryle argued, was not simply a matter of believing and of feeling, but of doing. We'd love to send you a copy of this book as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can find out more or give online at EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at one 833-99 833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or EncounterTheTruth.org. Back to the message. Here is Jonathan. The simplest, the biggest, and the clearest answer is the answer Paul gives us here in verse 12. God did these things, says Paul, for the praise of his glory. Now, I don't think that that answer is particularly intuitive for any of us. It runs contrary to our instincts and to the presuppositions of the culture all around us. But of course, that answer does fit in very well with the things we've been seeing here so far in Ephesians chapter 1. You remember that Paul really starts by praising God, verse 3, for all that he has done for us. God did all these things, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. And then jumping down a little, God saves us to be his possession, verse 14, to the praise of his glory. The whole story, the whole drama of salvation, it is all about the glory of God. It is all about bringing everything under the headship of Christ that he might be the all in all. Now, you and I are included. We benefit God loves us greatly, but at the end of the day, the story is not primarily about us. It is primarily about him. And actually, if we have an understanding of who God is, we realize that the story should be primarily about him. You see, if we know the God of the Bible, we know that he is worthy. 
that he is glorious. And it's entirely right and entirely appropriate that the story should focus on him and should bring praise and glory to him. Now, all of this, as we process it and digest it, it should be quite humbling for us. Maybe it's a little bit uncomfortable. I, I think it is. Maybe a part of you feels a little bit indignant at this idea. I don't know. But it's also worth recognizing that while this truth is humbling for us, rightly humbling, it is also immensely liberating too. If it's really the case that the purpose of my life and the purpose of your life is to bring glory to God, if the purpose of God for us within his wider eternal plans is to bring glory to himself, if that's the case, then you and I are actually set free. We are actually liberated from all kinds of other burdensome pursuits. You see, we're set free from the burden of seeking glory and pleasure for ourselves, seeking glory through career and then finding that it ultimately never satisfies us. Seeking glory through wealth and finding that it is an endless pursuit. Seeking glory through reputation, through popularity. Seeking to make our own name great and finding that none of that ever satisfies. That none of it ever fulfills. Living for ourselves, for our own pleasure and for our own glory, it is actually a very burdensome thing. It's burdensome because it never brings us fulfillment as we feel it should. But Paul is telling us here that life is not about me. And life is not about you. It is about God. And when we understand that, and when that truth sinks in for us, we find that it is a tremendous relief. After all, you and I were not actually built to carry all that burden of significance all that weight of glory. I've sometimes reflected, I wonder if you have too, I've sometimes reflected on how very difficult it seems to be for the big stars in Hollywood to carry all the weight of adulation and attention of so many fans, to carry the burden of the limelight. Have you ever noticed that? Some of them have terrible crashes of one kind or another, and I can't help but wonder if that ugly repeated cycle in Hollywood, I can't help but wonder if part of the issue is that these folk are carrying a weight of praise and of glory that we human beings were never built to carry. (laughs) Like a truck or a trailer that kind of buckles and breaks, carrying a load it was never designed to carry, never rated for, never built for. These stars are trying to live as mini-gods or they're thrust into that position. And it's just too much for any mortal human being to carry. And so often these people just self-destruct. See, the universe is not about any star in Hollywood or any of us. It is about God. Life is about him. And it's when we come to realize that we are here on this earth for his glory, it is when we make that discovery that life comes into its proper perspective and its proper proportion. Salvation is planned by God. It is intended for his glory. And next, it is effected by his word. Verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. One of the questions we naturally ask when we talk about God's sovereignty and salvation, about his planning and about his choosing and so on, one of the questions we naturally ask is whether this reality and this process just reduces us human beings to something akin to robots. Do you know what I mean by that? God is in the driver's seat. He either chooses us or he doesn't choose us. And we really don't have a very significant part to play, we might imagine. That's how it can feel. That's how it might sound. But it's very interesting that in this passage where Paul is emphasizing so much the sovereign initiative of God, he also emphasizes the fact that God engages with us through his word. And he emphasizes the fact that God calls for a response to the truth, our response of faith, of belief. Yes, God takes the initiative. Yes, God chooses, verse 11. Yes, he is in the driver's seat. But how actually do you and I come into the family of God and into the experience of salvation? How does that actually take place? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, we are included in Christ when we hear the word of truth. 
the salvation that God plans for each one comes to us not through a lightning bolt from heaven, not through some divine overpowering that bypasses our mind and our will. No, not at all. This actually happens through our minds, through information that we receive and process and act upon. The word of truth, the message of salvation in Christ, this gospel comes to us. We hear it. We engage with it. We come to understand it. We become convinced of its truth, and then we act upon it. Notice how the next sentence begins, middle of verse 13. Having believed. You see, salvation comes to us when we become so persuaded of the truth of the gospel, so persuaded of the truth of what we've heard, that we are moved to believe it. Yes, God is sovereign. Yes, God determines from eternity past whom he will save. But there is in this process no overriding of the rational capacities of any person. There is no diminishing of our personhood in the process. God's means of bringing salvation to his chosen people is to bring his truth to us, to enable us to understand it and to believe it. However we understand the mysteries of God's sovereign will in salvation, however we put all that together, and it's challenging as we spoke about last week, we do need to incorporate this basic reality. No one comes to salvation in Christ without hearing, without understanding, and without believing the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation. Now, that's why it's so important, if you're not a believer here today, that you really invest in engaging with the word of God, the Bible. It's why it's so good that you're here with us today to hear God's word. You see, God has no interest in bypassing your mind. Some will allege, and we've probably heard this charge being leveled, some will allege that Christianity is about brainwashing or about turning off the mind and about acquiescing to a kind of blind and mindless faith. But nothing could be further from the truth. God wants you to come to faith. He wants your heart, but he appeals to you through your mind, and he does so by his word. And so if you're exploring, if you're interested, if you're thinking, please don't switch off your brain at any point. Please don't imagine that you kind of leave your rational faculties at the door when you come in here. And please don't simply and exclusively follow your emotions. No, we need to listen to what God has said in the scriptures. And we need to see if we're convinced that what is said here is indeed true. And you need to see if you are moved and persuaded to believe. Jonathan Griffiths with part of our message, Chosen, Included, and Sealed. And we're going to continue this message on our next broadcast. I hope you make it a point to tune in. If you ever miss a program, come and listen online. Our website is EncounterTheTruth.org. You can stream the program or download an MP3 for free. Again, that's at EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, we're able to be on this station and bring you Encounter the Truth each day because of your financial generosity. So thank you for giving to and supporting this ministry. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to send you a book written by J.C. Ryle called Holiness. And Jonathan, I know this is kind of a Christian classic. Uh, So how has J.C. Ryle's writing and how has this book helped you? Well, I think I first became familiar with J.C. Ryle's writing when I was a teenager, actually, and growing in the faith and trying to understand the Word of God more deeply. And I recognized right back then how profoundly helpful J.C. Ryle is as a Bible teacher. And this book, Holiness, is one of his greatest contributions to the church, I believe. He holds up a, a mirror, really. Um, to the believer and asks whether we are taking seriously in our own lives the call to holiness that comes from Jesus. And I think he's especially helpful today because he's speaking from another era, another culture really, another age. And I think the challenge that comes from him as a Victorian 19th century believer actually comes with added weight to us today. I think it's it's a powerful call and a needed call to pursue holiness of life as we walk with Jesus. Well, we want to send you a copy of J.C. Ryle's Holiness as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can give us a call and give over the phone. The number is 1-833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884. 
or give online through our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. For Jonathan Griffiths, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.